Hey everybody, it's Wildman Z here for another edition of my library tour 2022. I got some cool books I've pulled off my shelf. It's um, getting now into the boxes and some of my mother's old stuff. This is uh, one though that I put, bought online about a year ago. I gave it to people last year, uh, I guess 2021 for Christmas. No, no, 2020 for Christmas. I gave this to uh, my workout partner, my aunt, and I got a copy for myself. This is put out by Arcadia Publishing. And uh, here's the uh, website for those that are interested. And uh, to see that map that it has under all the dots, they put out books uh, that have, they cover towns that are like little pictorial guides to give you history and some of the uh, scenes uh, and, you know, sort of local attractions of small towns across America. And as you can see from that picture, it's got quite a few, especially if you're on the East Coast of the United States, it looks like it's inundated with... Uh, with spots it has books for so you can go check that out i did i looked for long island and uh different areas that i've lived in a country like vermont and they have a lot of books this is from miller place that's a town on the north shore of long island and uh, i arguably well, i don't arguably I, technically i live in sound beach now which is a town adjacent to it but it used to be part of miller place back in the old days we became independent around 1929 uh miller place goes back to about the 1700s although there was a few people out here in the 1600s as well there's a house in rocky point which is a town next to us that uh, the Holocaust that goes back to the mid 1600s, and so there's some really old houses out here. Um, the house I'm in right now is a little bit under 100 years old, but it used to be an agricultural area. As you can see, there's hay bales. Um, not too much now. We still have a sod farm um, out here. The beaches are beautiful. They're rocky beaches with uh, cliffs. My grandmother used to own pavilions along the beach and sell things like umbrellas and suntan oil and things like that. That was popular back in the day. The, the big spot the, the tourists go to is uh, Mount Sinai Harbor and Cedar Beach in the summer. We have a pond. It's still there. It's a duck pond. And uh, it's not, not too good for fishing. Kids catch brim there. There's a whole bunch of uh, houses that are still around the Hopkins house. Uh, Burgess House. These are some of the older houses in the area. And like I said, a lot of them go back these days to the early 1800s. Most of the real, real old ones have fallen down. But uh, there's all sorts of really cool things in here. I actually found a picture of my mother in here. Here's an old fiddler. I don't know who this guy is, but he's remembered through history as the uh, local fiddler. Many well-bred young women at the time learned to play the piano for parlor entertainments, and men would often play the fiddle and dance, uh, fiddle at dances and parties. Here, D. Spencer Millard. So there's a Millard house here, yeah. The William Miller house, um, courtesy of Margaret Davis Gass. She's a local woman. I went to school with her son. Um, she was, she is or was, I'm not sure if she's still alive. She was a historian, but, um, you know, just really cool pictures. You know, there's some family uh, living in the area back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, looks like. Uh, 1874. So my grandmother came out here, I guess, in the 1920s from uh, Brooklyn. And uh, they, they go to about the 1960s. And even even until relatively recently, people used to ride horses around here. The last couple decades, the drivers have just gone out of the roof with uh, craziness around here. Terrible drivers, so you don't see horses too much anymore. My mother used to have a horse when she was uh, a little girl. And... Uh, you can still see the barn for it. I don't think there's any horse in there now. But you see, if, if you're if you're watching this and you're in America and you live in a small town, see if they have your uh, your town. It's really cool. It makes a good gift, and it's, and it's nice to have around if you see some old houses and you want to know about them. Here's the USA trilogy by uh, Dos Passos. It's three books. It's the 42nd Parallel, 1919, and The Big Money. I have not read this. This I believe this is one of my mother's books. It looks like a nice Library of America edition. There are notes in it and underlined marks. And so um, I'm curious when it was read, written. Uh, I know it was in the early 1900s. I'm not sure. Copyright 1930, 32, 33, 34. So it was in the 1930s it came out. And um, I, I come across this work all the time when I watch YouTube videos talking about Great Americana of that time period. You know, from you're in the uh, World War One to the Great Depression era in there. And uh, the Steinbeck comes up. And, of course, this book's mentioned all the time. It's sort of like considered like a forgotten classic. And I want to read it. I'll probably read it this year. Here's another book that I believe is my mother's sitting on a shelf here. And it's really... Uh, 
threadbare, but it's nice. It's the complete works of William Shakespeare. And uh, it has in here, uh, must have been some lecture that was associated with, uh, with, with this book or something. I, I, I don't know if my mother got this at a yard sale, but it had uh, all sorts of little pamphlets in it and so forth. Really cool. Uh, I'd be careful here. Picture of the bard on the first page. This is strictly, um, this is a nice book, the, illustrated by Rock, Rockwell Kent. I don't know who that is, um, but there are illustrations in here. This is for uh, one of the Henrys. Let's see which one it is. Really cool illustration. Uh, the first part of King Henry the Sixth. So I have not, the, I've read about half to two thirds of Shakespeare's plays, and I've actually put off the Henrys and the Richards, the, the king, the one, except for King Lear, the ones about the kings are the ones I've abnegated. I have not been reading them in here. Uh, most of Shakespeare I read back in the day. I did read several plays last year. I read The Tempest, uh, Taming of the Shrew, and one other one. Uh, I reread Hamlet, the second or third time. And what I'm doing these days when I read it is. Yeah, I like to actually understand fully what I'm reading. This is written in Middle English, of course, and th that's what this is, but it has a lot of notes with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of words in Shakespeare from Middle English that mean different things, like brave meant uh, attractive or good-looking back in the day, so let's talk about a brave woman. It does not mean a woman is a sword fighter. That's the connotation of brave these days. You're courageous or heroic. Brave didn't mean that back in the old days, and, and so forth. So I like to read it in the Middle English and then read the Modern English and then go back and then usually aloud read it out loud to keep the rhythm. And I like, so it's an iteration. So it takes me a while to read one. Maybe it takes me three or four days because I'm reading it three or four different ways. And then I try to watch a play on it or a movie. Uh, I really enjoyed watching, uh, after reading The Tempest, watching uh, the Helen Mirren uh, Tempest that was came out a few years ago. It's great. She played Prospero, who was the female takeoff of Prospero, the uh, sorcerer. It was fantastic. And then I also watch like college productions and so forth. And I get a lot out of watching it. It makes the makes the jokes, which have a big physical element to them, make a lot more sense. Uh, here's the greatest story ever told. And this is another one of my mother's books. It has some writing in it of hers. Fulton Osler, O O U R S L E R. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. This is a a tale of the greatest life ever lived. It's about Jesus Christ. It says a reverent and faithful retelling of the ever new, everlasting story of Jesus, written with powerful simplicity. I generally like stories like that. Like I like the uh, Last Temptation of Christ, which obviously had a fictional element to it. If you believe in the uh, literal interpretation of uh, literal story of Jesus, which I really don't, but I love Jesus' morals and how he tried to reform the church of his day. So um, that's how I usually read the New Testament of the Bible. I look at the morals that are described. But yeah, I like to read things like this. I'm gonna probably read it in the next year or so. Here's a book I read about half of in the, back in the day, and I need to get back and finish it. I uh, just put it aside for some reason other than didn't get back to it. It's Ernest Mayer's Toward a New Philosophy of Biology, Observations of an Evolutionist. Ernest Mayer, I came across him a lot in uh, my studies of ornithology, like fiducia and so forth, and just reading publications and journals. He's always mentioned. He's big with evolution, but particularly birds. That's like kind of his model system. And, you know, he talks a lot of basics about here. The, uh, this is Observations of an Evolutionist. It deals with a lot of basic questions like what is life? What do we mean by a species? What is meant by the Darwin mechanism of evolution? He also speculates a lot on uh, sort of philosophical or speculative aspects of biology like, you know, extraterrestrial biology, does it exist, and so forth. Like I said, I only read about the first half of it, and, but it's really good. I would say this is a book for somebody with a biology background a little bit. You don't need to be a biologist, but certainly take a course or two to understand. You know, you understand the basics of Lamarckian versus Darwinian evolution and so forth to go into that. Here's something, I guess it's technically graphic novel, but what the hell, I'm going to show it. It's uh, really cool. This is uh, Superman, The Man of Tomorrow. And it's by uh, Alan Moore with Kurt Swan with a little backup art by uh, George Perez. And even the cover is cool. Look at that groovy statue of, uh, of Superman that was drawn by uh, Kurt Swan. I'm not a big DC guy, but I'm, uh, I'm a Marvelite. But I know the good stuff when I see it. And I heard just discussed on uh, Steve Donahue and Michael K. Vaughn. They, they have a little show every week. It's uh, Wednesdays. It's like Epic Comic Wednesdays. And they do cover Marvel and DC Comics. But look at this groovy artwork. That's the, uh, what are those guys called? The Legion of Superheroes is one of the Brainiacs. And 
really like the clean lines. I like the way that uh, the muscular physiques, but they're not overly done. They look realistic. And uh, they were talking about this book, and I ordered it. I read about the first half of it this morning. It's really cool. And it's obviously it's a backlash to uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, where DC really did a boneheaded move of deciding to uh, reframe or redo their whole universe from scratch, scrapping all that rich tradition they had with all these characters. You know, it seemed like a harebrained scheme. And then letting writers who weren't really hardcore DC writers, like, let's say, John Byrne, come on the board. He's a, really an artist. He's not a great writer. He's a great artist. And let him run forth with the uh, tale of Superman. They did that in other books as well. And I remember back in the day when I was, uh, I decided to check it out. I wasn't a big DC reader. I was a Marvel. Like I said, I was a Marvelite. But I, want, I love John Byrne from the Uncanny X-Men. He did the FF, and he had his own book called Alpha Flight for a while. And I always thought he was fantastic. So I said, I'll check him out. Maybe he's a good writer, too. And... Uh, because he wrote the, he wrote and drew the FF and it was pretty good. Um, it was horrible. It was like I have a bunch of them upstairs. I'll show if people are interested. The art was great. The storytelling was weak, and so I bought a few issues, maybe eight or ten or so, uh, just because I liked the art. But then I was like, boy, the stories are really lame here, <laughs> you know. And so, and it's, I, you know, I had a hard time imagining how you could take Superman, a uh, guy with alien with all these powers with obviously a legion of really bad guys he fights like bizarro and lex Luthor and you know all these other you know all these other guys that in mix will put and brainiac how you can make it boring and he has different women that like him lois lane lana lang uh he even had a mermaid girl for a while didn't he i'm not a dc guy but i've seen a picture of him with a, a mermaid girl and so he was a player right and it's like taking him and making him boring so at any rate, I think I was turned off to DC initially as a kid because we had limited money. I had to make a choice when I go to Genevieve's Pharmacy, uh, where we used to buy comics back in the 70s. You know, I had maybe a dollar, so a change, and you know, we didn't have a lot of money, so I could buy maybe two, arguably three comic books. And I always went for the teams. The first thing I would always get with the Avengers it had Cap, Iron Man, Thor. Then I went for the FF because it had. Some really weirdos, they have the human torch and the thing. I mean, one guy sets on fire, another guy was like a rock. So I used to see them on lunchboxes and just be intrigued. And the logical question is, why didn't you try the JLA, uh, Justice League of America? Because, you know, Cap, I mean, excuse me, uh, Superman, uh, you have Wonder Woman, you have Batman, Aquaman, Hawkman, all these really great iconic characters, the Green Lantern, Flash. I think it was I got turned off by the cartoons. They had a Justice League cartoon when I was very young, and it had these terrible, campy, childish characters called the Wonder Twins, which I guess were written in to try to get the young kids into it, but I know it turned me and a lot of other kids off. And then there was that ridiculously campy uh, Batman, which was actually before my time uh, with Adam West, but they were playing it, um, playing it in rerun on TV, and my mother used to love it. And I hated it. I thought it was really campy and like Batman was ineffectual. He looks he looked like he didn't look tough in that suit at all. He didn't look like uh like the modern Batman with that dark looming. It was kinda gray. <laughs> like like, you know, it just looked campy. He didn't look like a tough guy. The gadgets weren't that interesting. In retrospect, I go back and I, I I've watched a few of them online and I'm like, it's pretty damn cool. It's a it's a it's a parody. But I didn't get that when I was younger. So I, I went the Marvel direction. So, um, you know, over time I want to go back and check out some of the classic DC stories. That's one of the reasons I watch Steve Donahue, because he's a he's an old school DC guy. And he'll point out some good old books. And so yeah, I try to dig them up online, see if they're in an archive or something like this. And this is a good story. It's, uh, you know, it's sort of like the last days of Superman type of thing. I haven't finished the book, but... Uh, it was about halfway through it, and it's uh, I think it's written in response, like I said, to these people saying, "My God, you're you know, you're, you're deconstructing Superman, the greatest character, and other and other DC characters, the greatest characters in, in comic book history, for what?" And so they write this story, and even the intro to it, they they say something that's really alluding to. Uh, the bonehead move, like I said, that they were making. It says, uh, this is an imagined story, which may never happen, but then again may, about a perfect man who came from the sky and only did good. It tells of his twilight, when great battles were over and the great miracles long since performed, of how his enemies conspired against him, and that final war in the snow-blind wastes of the northern lights, of the women he loved. I think they're kind of talking about 
the people that came out with the infinite crisis it ends in a wink you know it's it's uh yeah superman died 10 years ago i think i think this is really written in response to uh to the infinite crisis which I read, and as I read it, it was one of those miasmatic, extremely confusing, look at this beautiful art, stories. I really uh, had so much going on. It seemed so random that it was their big event. And I was like, again, it turned me off from DC back in the day. So I really think I have I have a skewed view to DC. I need to go back and uh, read some of the good classic stuff, the Kurt Swan stuff, the Jerry Conway stories, and the other ones. I, I, I'm not familiar with the DC uh, bullpen like I am, the Marvel bullpen. And uh, really, I, I love the Teen Titans. Now, that was, you know, I was getting a little older there. And they came out, and uh, I got them later. I got them in some sort of compiled form. Uh, they're great. Read them. And I also love the Alan Moore Swamp things. They're really good. But, um, you know, the Superman, Wonder Woman's, and all that, I'm, I'm really, you know, other than a few select stories, I'm really, uh, as for a comic book guy, I'm, I'm very lacking in knowledge of that. I love Marvel, like I said, but... Anyway, that's that wraps up my little tour for today. I hope you uh, I hope I didn't ram, ramble too much, and uh, I'll get you with some more books in a day or two, um, hopefully. Wild Man Z out. Thank you.